the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Today we'll be looking at a larger portion of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 7, verses 7 through 25. I encourage you to open up your Bible to that section or look it up to follow along. Paul begins this section by asking, is the law sin? It certainly feels like it. We get uncomfortable when we hear or read God's law, when it speaks of its demands and judgments and condemnation. We hate the law, and it would be so much easier to find fault with the law than with ourselves. But no, the law is not sin. Rather, it reveals sin. It uncovers what we work so hard to bury. It convicts us of what we're convinced is no big deal. It shows us who we truly are by nature, regardless of how well the world would speak of us. And so on this side of heaven, the law will always be necessary. But not for the purpose most think. Most assume God gives us his law to show us the path to heaven. Paul knew that wasn't the case. Yes, Jesus says, do this, do what the law says, and you will live. But Paul recognizes, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. This is what the law does. It does not give you a list of good things to do to get closer to God. It shows you how far you have fallen from God. The law brings death and dead people can't do good things. They can't do anything. And yet in the previous chapter, Romans 6, Paul gave us this beautiful picture of what God has accomplished for us in baptism. Baptized into Christ, we were crucified with Christ. Your baptism is where you died, not because of your sin, but to your sin. The slave-master relationship you once had with sin is over, and it no longer controls you. In your baptism, you were raised with Christ as a new person who is now capable of living a life that is a beautiful, fragrant sacrifice to God. Dead to sin, alive in Christ. So what does this new Christian life now look like? Well, using himself as an example, Paul describes it. I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate, I do. This new person Paul was raised to be in his baptism is perfectly in line with the will and law of God. What God says is good, Paul sees as good and wants to do it in his life. What God calls evil, Paul detests and wants to avoid it, avoid it at all costs. But when it comes time to take inventory of his actions, Paul finds just the opposite has taken place. You've experienced that. You know what is right. You had every intention of doing what is right. You even wanted to do what is right, but you end up doing the opposite, the very things you hate. Why? Well, because, Paul says, there is an intruder living in you one who has nothing good to offer your life, whose every inclination is always sinful all the time, who has no care or concern for doing what is right, whose only goals are to get you to do what you hate and to avoid what you know is good. That intruder is sin. It's your sinful nature. Paul describes it this way, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I don't want to do. This, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I don't want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Now Paul gets it. He writes, I find this law, this principle, this truism always at work without fail. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Because sin lives in me, I can't escape it. 
It's always there. Even when I want to do good, evil springs to life, causing me to sin. For in my inner being, in this new righteous person God has made me by faith, I delight in God's law. I love what God commands. And I've made up my mind to do what he says. But but I see another law, another principle, another truism always at work in the members of my body. I see something different in the things I actually do, waging war against the law of my mind, what my new self knows to be good and wants to do right. And it makes me a prisoner of the law of sin, my sinful nature, which is at work within my members. Paul gets it. The question is, do you? Friends, there's a war going on inside of you between the new person God has made you to be by faith in Christ, holy, righteous, who wants to do God's will, and this, this evil intruding enemy, your sinful nature. You can't beat him with good intentions. No, the path to hell is paved with those. You can't even beat him by carrying out those good intentions. No, evil is always right there with you. As you step back and look at how Paul describes this battle, you begin to see how bleak the outcome actually is. Sin is living inside me and there's nothing I can do about it. And if sin lives in me, then defeat and death is the only outcome I should expect. But again, Paul gets it. He readily admits what we try so hard to hide. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? There is no skirting the issue here, no passing the buck, no kid gloves or excuses. Though Paul does not claim the sin as his own, yet because it lives inside of him, he has no choice but to accept the death sentence it brings to his body. The only hope he has must come, not from within himself, where sin lives, not from his own members, which are constantly putting his inner sin into action. His only hope must come from outside himself, from someone else, someone willing to save him, someone willing, willing to rescue him from the imprisonment of his internal enemy. Someone willing to put on his flesh and blood and serve his sentence, but who would risk their life to save such a wretched man? Well, Paul got that too. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus not only risked his life, but gave his life by making our death sentence his own. By his death on the cross, Jesus paid the price to rescue us from the imprisonment of our sin and to set us free. It was never in doubt. Paul knew the answer before he even asked the question. In a paragraph filled with confusion, Paul was certain about this. He was a wretched sinner, and Jesus died for him anyway. I pray that confidence is also yours. There's no reason for it not to be. You and I are wretched sinners, but Christ rescued us anyway. And now, having been rescued, we live in Christ to fight another day. The same Jesus who rescued us also strengthens us to do battle against our sinful nature when he feeds us in his word and through his sacrament. So keep on battling, brothers and sisters. No, it's not easy but it's a battle worth fighting. And when you want to hang your tiresome heads after a long day of defeats, remember the words of the one who rescues you. Come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus gives you daily rest in his gracious promise of forgiveness. Ultimately, he will give you eternal rest in heaven when the battle is over. And when we want to hold our heads high after a brief moment of victory of saying yes to God and no to our sinful nature, look up. Look up and give credit where credit is due. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray. Gracious Lord God, what a wretched man I am. Yet in your grace you rescued me from this body of death. We give you thanks for your continued patience and ask for your strength 
daily fight against sin and temptation. Grant us the victory, O Lord, that your name would be praised and all glory be given to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.